Welcome to this Douglas Academy video for Broad General Education English. We're going to be having a series of lessons on a short story called Lamb to the Slaughter by Roald Dahl, and this will lead to the writing of a critical essay. These lessons are designed to support you with your study of a literature text. They're suitable for S1 to 3 pupils writing a critical essay. The essential skills that are covered in this series of lessons are listening to text, reading and analysing text, selecting quotations and planning, structuring and writing a critical essay. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the section of the text that involves the police investigation. In the last lesson, we discussed Mary's reaction to killing her husband and how she makes sure that she has an alibi. In this lesson, we're going to look at the police investigation of the murder. Do you think Mary will be caught by the police detectives? Let's listen to the rest of the story and find out. A few minutes later, she got up and went to the phone. She knew the number of the police station, and when the man at the other end answered, she cried to him, Quick! Come quick! Patrick's dead! Who's speaking? Mrs Maloney! Mrs Patrick Maloney! You mean Patrick Maloney's dead? I think so, she sobbed. He's lying on the floor and I think he's dead. Be right over, the man said. The car came very quickly and when she opened the front door, two policemen walked in. She knew them both, she knew nearly all the men at that precinct, and she fell right into a chair, then went over to join the other one, who was called O'Malley, kneeling by the body. Is she dead? she cried. I'm afraid he is. What happened? Briefly she told her story about going out to the grocer and coming back to find him on the floor. While she was talking, crying and talking, Noonan discovered a small patch of congealed blood on the dead man's head. He showed it to O'Malley, who got up at once and hurried to the phone. Soon other men began to come into the house. First a doctor, then two detectives, one of whom she knew by name. Later, a police photographer arrived and took pictures, and a man who knew about fingerprints. There was a great deal of whispering and muttering beside the corpse, and the detectives kept asking her a lot of questions, but they always treated her kindly. She told her story again, this time right from the beginning, when Patrick had come in and she was sewing and he was tired, so tired he hadn't wanted to go out for supper. She told how she'd put the meat in the oven, it's there now, cooking, and how she'd stepped out to the grocer for vegetables and came back to find him lying on the floor. Which grocer? one of the detectives asked. She told him, and he turned and whispered something to the other detective, who immediately went outside into the street. In fifteen minutes he was back with a page of notes, and there was more whispering, and through her sobbing she heard a few of the whispered phrases. Acted quite normal, very cheerful, wanted to give him a good supper, peas, cheesecake, but impossible that she... After a while, the photographer and the doctor departed, and two other men came in and took the corpse away on a stretcher. Then the fingerprint man went away. The two detectives remained, and so did the two policemen. They were exceptionally nice to her, and Jack Noonan asked if she wouldn't rather go somewhere else, to her sister's house perhaps, or to his own wife, who would take care of her and put her up for the night. No, she said. She didn't feel she could move even a yard at the moment. Would they mind awfully if she just stayed where she was until she felt better? She didn't feel too good at the moment. She really didn't. Then hadn't she better lie down in the bed? Jack Noonan asked. No, she said. She'd like to just stay right where she was in this chair. A little later, perhaps, when she felt better, she would move. So they left her there while they went about their business searching the house. Occasionally one of the detectives asked her another question. Sometimes Jack Noonan spoke at her gently as he passed by. Her husband, he told her, had been killed by a blow on the back of the head administered with a heavy blunt instrument 
almost certainly a large piece of metal. They were looking for the weapon. The murderer may have taken it with him, but on the other hand, he may have thrown it away or hidden it somewhere on the premises. It's the old story, he said. Get the weapon and you've got the man. Later, one of the detectives came up and sat beside her. Did she know, he asked, of anything in the house that could have been used as the weapon? Would she mind having a look around to see if anything was missing? A very big spanner, for example, or a heavy metal vase? They didn't have any heavy metal vases, she said, or a big spanner. She didn't think they had a big spanner, but there might be some things like that in the garage. The search went on. She knew that there were other policemen in the garden all around the house. She could hear their footsteps on the gravel outside, and sometimes she saw a flash of a torch through a chink in the curtains. It began to get late, nearly nine, she noticed by the clock on the mantel. The four men searching the rooms seemed to be growing weary, a trifle exasperated. Jack, she said, the next time Sergeant Ninnan went by, would you mind giving me a drink? Sure, I'll give you a drink. You mean this whisky? Yes, please, but just a small one. It might make me feel better. He handed her the glass. Why don't you have one yourself, she said. You must be awfully tired. Please do. You've been very good to me. Well, he answered. It's not strictly allowed, but I might just take a drop to keep me going. One by one, the others came in and were persuaded to take a little nip of whisky. They stood around rather awkwardly with the drinks in their hands, uncomfortable in her presence, trying to say consoling things to her. Sergeant Noonan wandered into the kitchen, came out quickly and said, Look, Mrs Moloney, you know that oven of yours is still on and the meat's still inside. Oh, dear me, she cried, so it is. I better turn it off for you, hadn't I? Will you do that, Jack? Thank you so much. When the sergeant returned the second time, she looked at him with her large, dark, tearful eyes. Jack Noonan, she said. Yes, would you do me a small favour, you and these others? We can try, Mrs Maloney. Well, she said, here you all are, and good friends of dear Patrick's too, and helping to catch the man who killed him. You must be terrible hungry by now, because it's long past your supper time, and I know Patrick would never forgive me, God bless his soul, if I allowed you to remain in his house without offering you decent hospitality. Why don't you eat up that lamb that's in the oven? It'll be cooked just right by now. I wouldn't dream of it, Sergeant Noonan said. Please, she begged, please eat it. Personally, I couldn't touch a thing. Certainly not what's been in the house when he was here. But it's all right for you. It'd be a favour to me if you'd eat it up. Then you can go on with your work again afterwards. There was a good deal of hesitating among the four policemen, but they were clearly hungry, and in the end they were persuaded to go into the kitchen and help themselves. The woman stayed where she was, listening to them speaking among themselves, their voices thick and sloppy because their mouths were full of meat. Have some more, Charlie? No, I better not finish it. She wants us to finish it. She said so. Be doing her a favour. Okay then, give me some more. That's a hell of a big club that the guy must have used to hit poor Patrick, one of them was saying. The doc says a skull was smashed all to pieces, just like from a sledgehammer. That's why it ought to be easy to find. Exactly what I say. Whoever done it, they're not going to be carrying a thing like that around with them longer than they need. One of them belched. Personally, I think it's right here on the premises. Probably right under our very noses. What do you think, Jack? And in the other room, Mary Maloney giggled. So you'll see here at the end of the story that Mary does get away with the murder of her husband. But why is this? Well, one of the main reasons is that she is herself an unexpected murderer. We're going to look at a couple of extracts from the text. Does Mary meet the expected profile of the murderer the police are looking for? Extract 1. Which grocer? One of the detectives asked. She told him and he turned and whispered something to the other detective, who immediately went out into the street. In 15 minutes he was back with a page of notes 
and there was more whispering, and through her sobbing, she heard a few of the whispered phrases. Acted quite normal, very cheerful. Wanted to give him a good supper, peas, cheesecake. Impossible that she. Take a few notes in your jotter now and explain why this particular extract shows that Mary is not considered to be the murderer by the police. Here's a second extract that we're also going to look at to show that she's an unexpected murderer. Sometimes Jack Noonan spoke gently to her as he passed by. Her husband, he told her, had been killed by a blow on the back of the head, administered with a heavy blunt instrument, almost certainly a large piece of metal. They were looking for the weapon. The murderer may have taken it with him, but on the other hand, he may have thrown it away or hidden it somewhere on the premises. It's the old story, he said. Get the weapon and you've got the man. Pause here again and see if you can write down a few thoughts about this second extract. How do we know from this extract that they're clearly not suspecting Mary? Here's a summary of why the police do not suspect Mary. You'll see from the second extract that they're clearly looking for a male suspect. As Mary is a woman, and not only that, a pregnant woman, they perhaps see her as being too vulnerable or too weak to have committed such a violent crime. They also know Mary, as she is the wife of one of the policemen at their own precinct. They probably know her already as a loving wife, who really, as far as they know, doesn't have any motive to harm her husband. You'll see as well from the first extract that she does have a plausible alibi. And also, they're very puzzled about the murder weapon. They know it's been a big, heavy object, but because they're looking for a male suspect and they don't suspect Mary, they're not looking for the frozen leg of lamb. One of the most interesting things about lamb to the slaughter is thinking about whose side we end up on by the end of the story. You might expect in the beginning that if we told you it was a story about policemen trying to catch a murderer, that we'd be on the side of the police. However, by the end of the story, you may find yourself siding with Mary and wanting her to get away with the murder. Let's have a look at why this is. One of the main reasons that we side with Mary rather than the police is because there's quite a contrast in behaviour between the police officers and Mary herself. We're going to get you to fill out a little table in your jotter now where we're going to pick out some of the characteristics that both sets of characters show. So first of all, the police. The police do come across as not being as intelligent as Mary is herself. The first reason for that is that they give up on investigating Mary too quickly. But you could also add a second reason to this. And we'd like you to think of two reasons that you found from the text that Mary is an intelligent person and that we can admire her for her intelligence. The second set of contrasts is that the police people can come across as being a little bit unprofessional and not well mannered at times, especially towards the end of the story. Can you think of a couple of reasons why this is? Mary, by contrast, is known as a good person and she can be seen as a good person who has been caught in a bad situation and made a mistake. The first reason for that is knowing her backstory. She's always put her husband's needs first in their marriage right up until she's betrayed. Can you think of any other reasons why you might consider her to be a good person caught in a bad situation? Once you've filled out the table, you can go on to the next slide. Here's some possible answers that you might look at in terms of contrast between the police and Mary that might explain why you end up siding with Mary. You might see the police as being a bit stupid, because they give up investigating Mary and assume that the murderer is instead a man. 
Whereas Mary herself is really intelligent. She makes sure very quickly that she has a convincing alibi and even by the end of the story gets the detectives to actually eat the evidence. The police as well can be at times a bit unprofessional and not well mannered. First of all, you probably notice that they were accepting alcohol when on, when on duty and this isn't really allowed. The second reason is towards the end, Val presents them as being a little bit rude. They're eating with their mouths full of meat and they're burping. Whereas Mary is seen to be a good person caught in a bad situation. We know that she's always put her husband's needs first in their marriage until she's betrayed and also that she's pregnant and wants to protect her child. As well as being an unexpected story in many ways, Lambs the Slaughter also has an unexpected ending. The last few lines read, Personally, I think it's right here on the premises. Probably right under our very noses. What do you think, Jack? And in the other room, Mary Maloney began to giggle. At the end of the story, we have a real twist in the plot when Mary gets the policeman to eat the murder weapon. Here, Roldal is using a technique called irony. We can say that it's ironic that the policemen are destroying the very evidence that they have been working so hard to look for. And it makes for a really great ending with a touch of humour. What have we learned in this lesson? Let's check your understanding. Mary herself is an unexpected murderer. She does not fit the profile of the murderer the police are looking for. The murder weapon is also so unexpected that the detectives destroy their own evidence. It's also unexpected that as readers, we likely find ourselves on Mary's side and rooting for her to get away with the murder. <laughs>